Okay, let's uh, begin with prayer. As we meet now for this study, dear Lord, uh, we thank you that we can read and study your word. And as we do so, we do so in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you for this day and your presence. And as we talk tonight about the provisions you provide for us every second of our life. And now we thank you for those uh, provision, the, for the provision of your word as we read it in the Bible and study it. The word that is alive and active because you are alive and active. So we ask that you would work through your word in the next hour, that we would see your love and provisions for us in the midst of life's challenges, whatever those are in each of our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. Can everybody see the slide? Yes. Okay, good. Good. Yes. Last, yeah. last week. Got it. Okay, great. Uh, if you'll recall, last week we uh, added an, a new dimension, or another dimension actually, to our study of uh, life's challenges and God's provisions. And that is, what do we do with the provisions that he has for us and all that uh, God does for us? And so if you'll take a look tonight, uh, we're going to look at the next set of three from the fruit of the Spirit, uh, patience, kindness, and goodness. And I chuckled this morning after all the uh, trying to get on and the uh, problems with Zoom, that patience was the first one that uh, 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 we were talking about this week. So again, all of you that are doing this live, thank you for your patience as we got all of that uh, ironed out. Before we dig into uh, biblical passages regarding uh, patience, um, does anybody have a definition that they like for patience or your thought about patience? Let me read. Uh, uh, definition from uh, which dictionary? Webster's Dictionary about patience. Bearing pains or trials calmly or without complaint. Manifesting forbearance under provocation or strain. Not hasty or impetuous. Steadfast despite opposition, difficulty, or adversity. <clears throat> And when I read that in light of this study, I thought, yeah, uh, that's, that's exactly uh, what kind of what we've been talking about in this study, uh, because even the definition of patience uses the words like pains, uh, trials, uh, provocation, opposition, difficulty, adversity. And, uh, you know, as we think about the, the uh, trials of life, challenges of life, uh, maybe those, there's a word or two in there that you think, yep, that fits my life at this particular uh, particular time. But then it also brings up what is what is our demeanor during this time. And so this is one of those things about this demeanor uh, in the midst of life's challenges. So uh, patience. Uh, depending on the translation you use, other, word, other uh, words that are used are either long-suffering or forbearance. Um, so we're going to take a look at the, these four passages uh, regarding uh, God's patience with us. First of all, Romans 2. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? 
1 Timothy, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. 1 Peter 3 For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Second Peter, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, <laughs> He is patience with, patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. Okay, what strikes you about these passages? Uh, what sort of hits my mind is it's, I never thought of Christ suffering and death as patience. And yet some of these patches, pass, passages seem to point that direction. Yes. Yep. These pa the mo Almost all the passages in the New Testament regarding patience, uh, God's patience towards us, has this theme in it. And the theme is our salvation. Uh, it's very interesting because some of the others we've looked at, uh, the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, and some we will continue to look at, uh, really deal with kind of the uh, kind of the daily living idea. Uh, as we go th uh, through our daily walk, and this certainly applies to that, but this, these four really point to a spiritual value in it and, uh, regarding uh, salvation and uh, the patience of God uh, regarding us as sinners. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I often think, man, if I was God, uh, I'm not sure I would have been that patient with, uh, with people. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, how long was God patient with people uh, from the time of uh, the Exodus in 1400? Let me think about all the way to when God's uh, patience, in a way, came to an end in around 500. You have almost a thousand years where God patiently waited for people to understand his relationship with him and wanting people to worship him, him alone, get rid of all the idols and stuff. Uh, hundreds of years he waited and was patient. And finally, he said, I, I've tried everything. I don't know what else to do other than to destroy the kingdoms Maybe that will bring them back to me. And we know that that happened. It was not a pretty, pretty scene what happened, but this is the idea of the remnant then that would come back, rebuild, and realize their mistake. And so, um, you know, the patience of God, uh, we see the Old Testament example of that uh, as well. Um, other comments about these passages or the thought the thoughts that I had about that okay uh, next uh, patience how about our patience in faith first of all Isaiah 7 then Isaiah said Hear now, you house of David, 
Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Okay, just stop there. How is the house of David trying the patience of Isaiah? Because that's what he's talking about here. How did they treat the prophets? Badly. Prophets had a very hard, extremely hard life. A couple of them, I, uh, Jeremiah, he loathed the day, he said, I loathe the day I was born. He wished he would have never been born. They were making his life so miserable. And so that's part of Isaiah's comment here. Uh, isn't it not, not enough to try the patience of men, talking about kind of the prophets, will you try the patience of my God also, which is the idol worship that I was previously talking about during uh, that approximately thousand year period where the people continue to succumb to idol worship. And so uh, they are, uh, the prophets are feeling that impatience of people and that uh, he certainly challenges them then regarding uh, God as well. For from uh, the New Testament, first of all, Colossians 1. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. James 5. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. In James 5, uh, uh, verse 10, uh, Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, and Revelation 13, if anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. And first of all, this, uh, let me get this, the laser pointing, this James 5 passage, uh, takes us back to the prophets that we were talking about in the previous slide, as well as up here in Isaiah 7. Comments about these four or any one of them? The Revelation passage really helps us to remember that the early Christian church got off to a horrible start, not in the term spiritually, but as far as the persecution that it underwent. And uh, if you look at an introduction to the book of Revelation, most introductions will talk about how John wrote Revelation to the persecuted church encouraging them to, to stand strong. I, I um, think of, I believe it's chap, chapter 2, verse 10, of be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. And so add, uh, encouragements like that, and encouragements like here in chapter 13, that uh, being captivity, even being killed, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Thoughts? One more slide regarding patience, and that is patience, uh, us with others. And the first paragraph is four, uh, prop, uh, four, uh, 
examples from Proverbs 14, 15, 19, and 25. A patient man has great understanding, but a quick-tempered man displays folly. A hot-tempered man stirs up dissension, but a patient man calms a quarrel. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to, to overlook an offense. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. Then four from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, love is patient. Ephesians, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 1 Thessalonians, and we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And then 2 Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. How does 2 Timothy differ from Proverbs, Corinthians, Ephesians, and Thessalonians? They all have the word patience in them, or being patient. What is different about the 2 Timothy? Did anyone pick up anything there? Um, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience. Regarding what? Uh, preaching the word. Okay. One of I was the, able to connect. Okay, good to see you, Ken. One of the things that happens when uh, there's a, a person... A person that comes to faith, and uh, for lack of better terms, we call them a new Christian. Uh, it's easy to kind of lose patience in that uh, for those of us who maybe been Christians all of our lives, we go, yeah, duh, with some questions they may ask. But we need to understand that this is such a radical change for them in their lives that it's, it takes a while to filter through all of that so they can begin to grasp the riches of this faith, and we need to be patient with that. Um, Paul, uh, or starting off with Saul, uh, when uh, Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, uh, he did not jump into uh, his mission work right away. Uh, kind of depending on uh, who you read, he spent at least three years doing this, uh, reading, studying, letting others help him, uh, others probably maybe encouraging him, correcting him when he had a wrong idea so that then he would be prepared to go out. And so it requires great patience sometimes with people uh, if, when they would come to faith and just encourage them and, uh, and uh, walk with them and that kind of thing. So I know I spent a lot of time on that. Uh, feel free to react to that uh, thought or any of those uh, other four passages. So the top four really deal with kind of the daily living aspect, you know, uh, uh, guidance for daily living in these passages. Uh, the second Timothy takes us kind of a bit of a different direction uh, regarding the spiritual aspect. And so the statement at the bottom that we started with last week, I'm not supposed to be just a container of patience. I'm meant to be a conduit of patience. Dave. Yes. So in that Second Timothy passage, could you say that patience is also used uh, as a teaching tool? Uh, you mean as an example? Well, yeah. I mean, if you're if preaching the word is sharing. Um, the gospel, 
and it's used to correct, rebuke, and encourage. So I would think with patience also, you're teaching along with that, if, especially if you're displaying it. Yes, exactly. Uh, because just think if you are walking with somebody who's new to the faith and you are impatient, uh, what a negative example of what it means to be a Christian, right? You have to uh, funnel through the patience. Okay, you know, wait a minute, you know, you, you relax. I know and being a teacher, that's one thing, you know, you have to really have a lot of patience or you don't manage to, you know, keep the attention of a student. Yeah, any of you out there that have been teachers in the school system uh, before uh, know um, how important that is to be patient, uh, how challenging it can be sometime with the kids in, in different ways. Uh, but again, uh, it's just uh, it is an important aspect as well. Okay, let's. And uh, Dave? Yes. It seems to me that uh, what I'm getting out of this is there, there is spiritual wisdom. And the spiritual wisdom, wisdom comes, uh, which helps grow our patience. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Okay, so wisdom and patience going hand in hand kind of thing. Right. And the more you know the word, which is wisdom, the stronger your patience can become. Kind of up here in Proverbs? Uh, yes, sir. Yep. Good. Yeah, a man's wisdom gives him patience. Yeah. Well, the wisdom would also help you be completely humble and gentle when you're speaking with people. Okay, exactly, exactly. Just like you know, uh, go ahead. the phrase right before that, a patient man calms a quarrel. I know there have been several times through my life when there's been a hot atmosphere in the air and I try to interject a little bit and calm it down so that it doesn't go all out of control. Mm -hmm. Right. Getting back to our introduction last week of the fruit of the spirit, just a reminder that, uh, you know, we talked about this patience being one where many people will say, well, uh, God left me out when it came to the patience part, uh, department. Uh, but uh, just a reminder that uh, it's one aspect of the whole fruit. And just like all the others, every person, every believer has patience. Uh, the challenge is how, you know, using it in our life. But everybody has it because we have the spirit. Therefore, we have all of the fruit well, in all of the aspects of the fruit, including patience. Even when we don't feel like it. Yes. Okay, uh, the next one, kindness. Uh, now, before we get to it, just a, a couple thoughts. I'm going to jump back up to, to this one before we get to those passages. Um, the, the next two, kindness and goodness. And there is one, the word for, the Greek word for kindness is sometimes also translated goodness. And so you have the same word that is often translated in these two ways. And so that helps us to understand how closely uh, these are related. Um, Paul separates them out a bit with two different, um, different words. Uh, the word for goodness, and then there would be a different word for kindness, okay? Now, the word for goodness, I'm, well, let me, let's start with kindness, I guess. Uh, it's actually, and I don't know if I can pronounce it correctly, um, crestitotes uh, is one where 
it's simply being kind and helpful. And this would be like Jesus uh, when he was kind to the, the, the woman who was a sinner who anointed his feet. Just that beautiful kindness to her. Uh, the other word regarding goodness uh, sometimes takes on a different kind of spirit. And um, a biblical scholar named Trench said that an example of this, this word for goodness was Jesus cleansing the temple. And I kind of uh, go, what? How in the world was that good? But then as I thought about it, how was Jesus cleansing the temple good? Getting rid of the people who were there for the financial gain of it rather than the religious and spiritual aspect of it. Who especially was the goodness for or the goodness towards? Those individuals coming to worship, you know, and okay, you know, oh, my way, I forgot something. Well, they, they go in there, you know, and with that, them being out of there, they could, you know, find something rather than right in the, you know, the temple. We don't realize how radical this was, what Jesus did. Because where he, where these uh, people set up their booths was in the court of the Gentiles. Basically, they weren't scamming everybody. The main ones they were scamming were the Gentiles. And so when Jesus did that and drove them out, he was expressing goodness to the Gentiles. And so that's where uh, this, this picture of goodness take, can take on a different flavor. And a couple people I read about this word uh, agree with it. So it's just not kind of do good, do good, do good. Sometimes it comes with a different kind of attitude where we might wrinkle our brow uh, a little bit because it's, it can be kind of a goodness shown by reacting to something bad in a way that we may not see as good, but in the big picture, it is good. And uh, we will see that again in just a little bit when we get to uh, the goodness idea. But I just wanted to bring up, while kindness and goodness are very close to each other, uh, there is a, a bit of a separation uh, between the two. Okay, so now. Uh, God's kindness to us. Genesis 39. Well, but while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison ward. Warden, Psalm 18. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Isaiah. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Isaiah 63, I will tell of the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for the house of Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. Okay, um, thoughts about any of these passages or as a whole? Overall, I guess sometimes it looks like maybe, you know, he's not showing us kindness, you know, when we run into some difficulty, but over the long run, yeah, if you maybe today that you can't see it, but a year from now, oh yes, he was showing me kindness at that time. The Isaiah passage, before we talked about uh, God's patience with the Old Testament people, um, but here in, in a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting, everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you. And so we see that big picture once again, 
uh, right here, this everlasting kindness. I'm sure the people didn't like it when God was angry with them. Um, but then God's uh, everlasting kindness expressed as well. The thing that is, is a little bit is different here than the patients because uh, when we did the patients, we talked about that spiritual aspect of God to us with the patients. Here, he brings up things such as uh, deeds for which he is to be praised, the many good things he has done, kind of that daily aspect. Now, this is spiritual as well. I understand that, uh, but it's more of, uh, the, the daily kinds of provision as well. And we'll see this uh, more in the next slide. Acts 14. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. And so you see that here, kind of back here with the, you know, the deeds that we, I mentioned before. Where is it? Uh, right here, the deeds for which is to be praised. And here, Acts gives some examples of the deeds of God. Romans 2. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance? And that is a repeat from uh, the one we were talking about patience here, uh, patience before. Romans 11, consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Ephesians 2, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And Titus 3, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And so we see kind of how this, uh, this picture here follows up with the patient idea uh, of God to us as well. Just kind of takes it another step that God's kindness just isn't a spiritual kindness we have expressed in daily things. We do have it here in the spiritual as well, right? Uh, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of what, anything we've done, but because of his mercy. Now, um, this, uh, just a, a quick question that, that came to mind. What word do we usually use about uh, God sending his son Jesus to save us. What's the one word we usually use? Love. Love. Right. Right here. Right. Exactly. Love. God, uh, John 3, 16. God so loved Love. the world. Exactly. And so that's the, the word we, we usually use and absolutely correct because it's in the Bible. And uh, but it's really interesting in these passages how, and, and uh, I guess this is just kind of a, a new thought to me that in addition to using the word love, how about also using the word kindness expressed in his kindness and love to us in Christ Jesus? Um, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. So here, uh, Paul combines the two together. But maybe uh, for me, I need to think about when I talk about God loving us so much, he came to die and save, uh, rise and save us. Oh, man, what a kind act that was as well. Anyone? That all sums it up pretty clearly. Okay. Uh, how about, yes, go ahead. 
It almost seems like most of these pertain to our sinful nature that his kindness came, came out, even though of our sinful nature. Uh, yes, I would agree with that. Um, but we can't limit, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. We can't limit it to that because all of a sudden you have pa passages like Acts. He has shown his kindness by giving you rain from heaven, crops, plenty of food. And so, um, while yes, I think that's the primary aspect of God's kindness and showing it, uh, how wonderful he shows his kindness for what um, we need every day. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, right? Give us this day our daily bread. Here it is up here in Acts. Romans gets it. All right, uh, what do we do with it? Uh, Psalm 141. Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Excuse me, let me start over. Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it. Proverbs, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Also Proverbs, he who despises his neighbor's sins, but blesses he who is kind to the needy. And 1 Corinthians, love is patient, love is kind. 2 Corinthians, rather as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness. Ephesians 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ in Christ God forgave you. And Colossians, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, hold yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Okay, uh, before we and go like on. Last week, you know, that that is, um, all of those are combined. I forget the word. It's the uh, uh, the um, talents or the um, gifts or the. Um, gifts of the Spirit. Uh, what's the word? Uh, but that not, we have all of these by virtue of the, 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 by our baptism. Yeah, our baptism. And, you know, it was like, okay, each, these are fruits, but it's all of this is the fruit. The, the, you know, it's like, okay, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience uh, uh, are all fruits, but no, it's the fruit combines right. all of these. Right. What's interesting also is how. Um, many of these passages that kindness is connected with other aspects of the fruit. Uh, you have uh, patience here. We've seen that before. Uh, uh, compassion is one we will deal with uh, maybe not next week, but the following week. Uh, patience and kindness once again. Um, down here, gentleness and patience again. So you have the, the, the connection with uh, many of these things uh, together uh, once again. It's always interesting how in Isaiah, it almost sometimes you think you're reading the New Testament because he is, you know, has so much, you know, knowledge, it's, it's so much foresight of what's going coming down the road. Mm -hmm, exactly. All right, uh, First Thessalonians. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. And Second Peter, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Okay, 
Okay, uh, thoughts about this? It, it, it's very easy to get into a, you know, a, a fault finding situation with somebody before you, you know, just like, you know, you got to clean the moat out of your eye before you get the splinter of your uh, brother's eye. And sometimes you see someone doing something and you think, well, that's terrible, but wait a minute, if they're looking at what you're doing, they think you're even worse. So you've got to, you know, as a child of God, you have to watch yourself and, you know, intently. It's just like, I still get the story of the police officer that pulls the lady over, you know, and says, I was afraid you were in a stolen car because uh, it says, you know, what would Jesus do and God is love and all this other stuff on the bumper and you were given the finger and everything else to the driver in front of you. So I thought maybe you were in a stolen car. <laughs> uh, Marsha, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, does this strike you with anything that you said before? Um. Right here, because you were talking about patience. If we don't exude that, then what happens? We become ineffective and unproductive, right? Correct. Yeah. This uh, passage um, in, in, in big theology words wonderfully describes also the sanctified life. That here's, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about what God has done for us. What, what are we going to do with it? And you just read this. Here's what it means to live as a Christian. That is what this, the sanctified life means. Here's a good definition of it right here. And also, uh, I think uh, one, probably last week we also talked about uh, as long as we're on earth, we will be a work in progress, and uh, we see this in here too, right? Uh, that uh, we will never fully attain it completely on this side of heaven, and so we continue to be a work in progress, and this really points that out. Yes. And then uh, our last statement again. I'm not supposed to be just a container of kindness. I'm meant to be a conduit of kindness. Okay, anyone else? Uh, a comment about kindness aspect? Okay, uh, before we get to the next one, just a question. There are nine aspects to the fruit of the Spirit. A little trivia question, I guess. Of the nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, which is the first one that's mentioned in the Bible? Love? Just nope. guessing? Nope. God's goodness. Where? Where do we find it? You're, you're right. Genesis. There we go. Isn't it fascinating? We're back to Genesis again. It's one of my favorite topics. Here we go. Genesis 1. God saw that the light was good. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. This aspect of God, this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, comes up immediately in Genesis chapter 1, that the essence of the goodness of God is displayed in his creation. And I just think that's really uh, fascinating uh, that all of a sudden, and I'd never, I'd not made the, that connection before working on this, that all of a sudden that we have the fruit of the Spirit uh, uh, this aspect takes us right back to Genesis, and that was the first aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, uh, the, this aspect of who God is, He is good, shows up in His creative activity. Psalm 23, 
Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Uh, now that's the NIV. Uh, um, we know the King James, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Psalm 27, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Psalm 31, how great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. Psalm 118, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 65 and 68, you crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. Your people settled in it, and from your bounty, O God, you provided for the poor. Psalm 107, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. And then uh, let's wait to, the, to get to John in just a second. But I think, you know, uh, Psalm 118.1 is, a, a, I won't say most quoted, but highly quoted uh, verses of the Bible. Exactly. Thanks for, for his good, for his love endures forever. Yeah. And this is just a small sample of how often the goodness of God is mentioned in Psalm. I don't know, but it seems to me also that we were talking about interchanging kindness and love. You can see it here too with good and goodness. We can interchange with the word love. There we go. So maybe love just encompasses a lot of all of this. I mean, it's just all these aspects of love and of, of uh, the goodness of God. And so if we think about the nine aspects of the, of the fruit, the first one that's mentioned is love, right? And maybe there's something to that. In other words, that while, uh, imagine my whiteboard back here, and I like doing that. While you have the fruit of the spirit being kind of that, the, the fruit being the umbrella, and under that you have the nine aspects, uh, maybe there's another umbrella over the whole thing, and that is love. And then these other eight are all, uh, examples for uh, lack of a better word examples of love yeah or love in the middle and all these examples come around and yeah another... come out of love each one when you have love you have this and when you have love you have that or you display this or display that okay yeah another good picture yeah, I think that is a good picture. And um, I remember the Bible verse that says God is love and God encompasses all of these things, goodness and kindness and patience. So I think I think it's right. I think love does encompass everything. Great. Yeah, I appreciate those thoughts. Remembering in the Psalms that uh, David didn't write them all, but he was the primary writer and you think of the life of David, and we've talked about that a number of times, the contrast in his life between uh, just being uh, 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 really, really bad sinner, bad person, you know, adultery, murder, uh, had a horrible family life, a horrible father many times and stuff. Uh, and yet the contrast to that in Psalms is how often David says, despite who I am as a sinner, how good God is to me. And uh, I think when we also read Psalms with those kinds of lenses on, um, you know, what, I think, what, Psalm 51, where he really brings up that contrast about being a sinner and yet the goodness of God as displayed in his forgiveness for him. And so I don't think there's any accident uh, why uh, David uh, wrote and used that word, the goodness of God, so often in the book of Psalms. And then one more on the bottom of this page, John 10, 11 and 14, 
I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And that uh, this passage from John, I should have written it on here, um, really is a fulfillment of Ezekiel 34. If you ever want to read a, um, a, a really good definition of the contrast between a bad shepherd and a good shepherd, I think Jesus is taking them uh, when he says, I am the good shepherd. And when he says that, I think people go, oh, yeah, Ezekiel talked about that, didn't he? And so uh, uh, if you have a few minutes, uh, take your Bible when we're done or sometime, read Ezekiel 34 about that contrast between uh, how a good shepherd treats his sheep and how a bad shepherd treats his sheep. Two passages on this slide. First Chronicles. Be strong and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. Romans 8. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now, we spent a, a bit of time talking about this uh, in one of the previous weeks, but in the discussion of the goodness of God, uh, what are your thoughts about this, or how does this uh, broaden our definition of the goodness of God? I see it not so much broadening, but limiting from the standpoint of, uh, I don't know, Jehovah Witnesses or something, you know, that for God for new, he had also predestined some to be conformed to the likeness of the Son, that you really have to work at getting that, getting into that point, you know, you just don't automatically get it. And they still, you know, John 3, 16 goes over their head. Yeah. When we were talking about Romans 8, that, okay, well, let's start with First Chronicles right here. The Lord will do what is good. Notice what he says. In our sight, no, in his sight. Yeah. And that's why in Romans 8, that parallel, and we know that in all things, God works for the good. Right? Uh, of those who love him. And so, all of a sudden, this expands our view of the goodness of God. And as we talked about uh, before, when there are things that we don't get and we don't understand and we don't see as good, and God, I don't think, calls them good, God sees the big picture. And these are big picture things. When we're limited to only seeing the past and the present right now, the immediate present, God just doesn't see the past and the present. God sees the future. And so uh, to me, what God is also saying is here is, I am working a good, even if you don't see it. And, right. so, and so, you know, these passages, again, broaden our view. It, the goodness of God just isn't, he's good to me spiritually. He sent Jesus to die for me. He sends rain and gives us crops and food, and he shows his goodness. That's it. That, that's, we just saw that on the previous slide. And all of a sudden we go, uh, I don't understand your goodness, God. And this is where faith and trust comes in. And I think God says, I know you don't understand. I just need you to trust me that I know what is good. Because then all of a sudden we get back to the Psalms once again. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. The goodness of God, the essence of good, does not depend on life's situations. 
who God is and his love, goodness, and mercy to us does not depend on the roller coaster of life. He is good all the time. That's why he can say, I will do what is good in my sight, even if you don't understand. I will work good, even if you don't see it at the time. And as we pointed out when we did this before, I know I'm reviewing, but it's so important. The ultimate good for us may not be a change in circumstances. The ultimate good is right here. That God works good to make us more like Jesus. That is the ultimate good, even if nothing changes in our day-to-day -day life. God has a purpose, a goodness behind it, and it's right here. And so I wanted to add these two slides to uh, broaden our thoughts about this idea of God's goodness to us, even when we don't get it or don't understand it. Okay, uh, it was a bit of a monologue. Uh, uh, anybody, any comments about that or anything to add to it? Feel free. So another big fancy word, the sovereignty of God. Here it is right here. That's another big word. The sovereignty of God shows up in these passages. Just, just the thought uh, in that um, what we perceive as good uh, usually includes, a, you know, a healthy, a good health and um, uh, being able to feed our families and things like that. But, but the good for God is that we spend eternity with him. I mean, that is our the good that God intends for us is that we spend eternity with him. Yes, the, excuse me, the ultimate goodness, right. That's right. exactly right, Carolyn. Okay. And yet in the midst of the ultimate goodness, he shows his goodness for daily life as well. That's true. Um, yeah, and so that's that big picture of God again. Right. Goodness. How about us to others? Matthew 5, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Romans, I am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge and competent to instruct one another. Psalms, they will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Uh, so this one takes as kind of our response to God. Uh, the, uh, the, we show our goodness in how we uh, praise God and joyfully sing for, to God for his righteousness. Ephesians 5. For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. First Peter. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And then a repetition, once again, from Second Peter, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that ties in with uh, in 1 Peter, when we live such good lives, they see our good deeds. And so this sanctified life that we talked about before is a witness. Witness also needs to include words but that they may see your good deeds. And so how we live our lives, how he described, Peter describes it in his second letter here, uh, that can be a witness to, uh, to those around us as well. Thoughts about goodness. Again, like he says, you know, we're the conduit. The more we let these things go through us and, you know, keep from being uh, judgmental or, you know, 
get you know mad for some reason you know and people seeing that in our lives they realize you know there's a christian person you know a god-fearing person and that maybe i need to be more like him or her mm -hmm. exactly and you mentioned it can but here it is again um taking liberty from Paul Tripp's uh, uh, quoting him, but I'm not supposed to be just a container of goodness. I'm meant to be a conduit of goodness. Okay, so uh, that's the second group of three from the fruit of the spirit. Uh, patience, kindness, goodness. Uh, any last thoughts pop into anybody's heads that they want to, to make? Hopefully next week it'll go smoothly and we'll be at 945. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Dave. Okay, let's uh, close with prayer then. We thank you for this hour, dear Lord. Um, and when we, even though we aren't physically together through the gift of technology, we can be together to uh, share with each other to uh, read your word and allow you speak to speak to us through it. And as today we looked at the three ways in which you provide for us by giving us your patience, your kindness, and your goodness. We have these, dear Lord, and yet they are challenged in using them sometimes in our lives when things don't go right. Um, and uh, but yet we have that, and so we pray that you would give us the strength to use these three aspects of your one fruit uh, every day of our lives, no matter what we are doing, no matter what the challenges we face. For you are our good and gracious God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks.